Another banner seminar. It's been quite a few years. It's nice to see some folks are Nice to see Victor <laughs> and others. Great to have you here. Um, I don't know where Todd is, so I'm just going to kind of look like Todd. I guess I can pull this off. Um, I see this sign up here. So if you're taking the 480 class, I guess I'll pass this around. Or not. I don't know. Forget it. Somebody else's thing. Um, I don't know. You get a free pass if you're in the class. You get an A today. <laughs> uh, but what I'm going to do is introduce uh, Rich Perry. Rich? Rich? Right? Yes. Rich, Rich uh, is a, uh, I'm going to half make this up, but I think I can pull it off. Um, one thing I know is, is both him and his wife, Lisa, are very proud graduates of Chico State and have sent nice letters on the behalf of graduates in geology. And um, after went on to UNR to get a master's um, and since then has had a pretty creative existence in the world of economic geology through petroleum, but mostly on, on the mineral side, doing what you do in this field, traveling around the world, getting that lots of different experiences, and moving on up through into management, which is where he is today. And uh, we're very thankful to have him come and visit and offer to give a talk. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm gonna turn these two off here. Thanks. It looks like it would Thanks. be. Okay, everybody see those okay? Perfect. Thank you. It's really nice to get invited back here again. And I'd like to introduce the best thing that ever happened to me here at Chico, which was meeting my wife, Lisa, because we both graduated in fellowship here. And these old guys back here in the middle were our professors, in case you didn't know it. <laughs> so it's always great to see them. Thank you for coming today. Um, I've got uh, a presentation here today, and I'm going to try to cover quite a bit of territory on it and I promise to be done in 45 minutes so that there's time to, to do questions and then I'm happy to stick around afterwards although I understand there's something in this class we can always take these rocks here and so forth and and go uh, go someplace else but I'm gonna I'm gonna try and cover five things here I'm gonna try to do a little bit on the geology of Nevada real real quickly just an overview uh, a little bit about the most prevalent types of deposits that we have uh, in Nevada, which are gold deposits. And then I'm going to cover uh, what I'm best at, the, the deposits and active mines in Nevada for precious metals, space metals, and industrial minerals. And kind of give you an idea of how those things uh, exist, how they're mined, what kind of deposits they are, and, uh, and how that fits into Nevada. Then I'm going to do geothermal energy and a little bit about oil. We don't have a lot of oil in Nevada, but we had a lot of activity in the last year. And I'm going to finish with some examples of mine reclamation, so the environmental part of the business that, that I was a part of for, for many years. I'm the administrator for the Division of Minerals for the state of Nevada. I spent most of my career in, in economic geology and in mining in Nevada, Indonesia, and Uzbekistan. All places, right? And then made the circuitous route back into uh, where, where I started, which was in Reno. My wife and I live in Carson City. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and get going here. And uh, I, I put this slide in here just to give some reference here, and you have a map when you came in, but this is a satellite photo of California and, and Nevada, and what, what I'm going to do here on the next couple slides when we look at geology, so just reference Reno, Winnemucca, Austin, Eureka, and Ely, because of those are the towns that go across Interstate 80 through central Nevada, where a lot of of the geology and mining. A lot of the geology I'm going to talk about is in a lot of the mining takes place. So let's start here with some with some quick geology. And I want to credit these slides to one of my employees who's also a graduate of Cal State Chico here, Lucia Patterson, who works for the Division of Minerals, who put them together. And she's much better at this than I am. But we're going to start in the Cambrian. How many of you are geologists, by the way? Okay. Nearly everybody here, huh? A few, how many environmental scientists? Okay, good. Um, so I'll, I'll try to do this kind of in a, in a fairly basic fashion. So, so here's a cross section through Nevada. And again, Ely, Eureka, and off to the coast here on over to Reno and California was really, as the geologists like to call it, the deep, dark, and ugly period there uh, where, where we had uh, carbonate shelf uh, uh, deposits being formed about a Eureka here, and then and then we had a deep sea off to the coast of what is now uh, California and most of Western Nevada. Advanced to the Devonian uh, period, and and you have a continental collision here, 
uh, which was uh, it is referred to geologically as the antler orogeny, which which was uh, which had deep water sediments off that were formed off the coast here thrust over the carbonate platform here in about the central part of the state forming what, what geologists call the Antler Highland. So these are the carbonates and these are the siliceous sediments and in Nevada that was called the Roberts Mountain Alak Thaw. Moving on to the Mississippi and Permian, the later part of the, the Paleozoic, we had the Antler Highland here which was partially out of the water and to the east, you had clastic sediments being formed in, in the Eureka Ely uh, area there. And off of the coast here towards Reno, the, the uh, ground was still underwater forming uh, sh shallow water and carbonate sediments. So let's move on to the Mesozoic here. The early Triassic saw what's called the Sonoma Neurogeny. And once again, we had uh, plate collisions where we had um, Rust faulting of what's called the Golconda Alakthon over the uh, upper plate of the antler um, uh, rocks that are here. And in the Triassic, Jurassic, the rest of the Mesozoic there in Nevada, there was a lot of a lot of folding and thrusting, and that's when a lot of the Paleozoic rocks got got bent and folded and, and structurally complex. Towards the end of the Mesozoic, you have the uh, Cretaceous Age Sierras starting to form down here, but not exposed yet. And then in the Cenozoic, uh, the early Cenozoic was uh, there's not many rocks exposed, or not many rocks formed in the early Cenozoic because it was mostly erosional. About the mid Cenozoic, uh, 17 million years ago, what what formed the physiographic province that you see now from of, in Nevada all the way to Salt Lake City is the Basin and Range province, which is extensional block faulting. So it's being pulled apart, and you see mountain ranges and valleys, horse and grovens all the way across the state. Nevada has 99 mountain ranges, and in between all of those are deep valleys of sediments. Uh, quaternary alluvium, so gravels, and all of those Paleozoic age rocks are then exposed in the mountains and presumably are down there at the bottoms of the valleys. Uh, the Sierras then climbed up into what we have them today, so here's Reno right here, all the way to the eastern half of the state. Kind of a diagrammatic part of, of the geology of Nevada. The volcanism that we saw during that period, because there's a lot of ash flow tufts that were erupted, started about 43 million years ago in the north part of the state, and uh, worked their way to the south, where they're about 17 million years old. So there's lots of, of, of uh, bimodal volcanic basalts and some rhyolites that, it, that you find out in the ranges out there. OK, so there's, you know, Geology from the Precambrian to now in two slides, <laughs> and we'll move on uh, to a couple of idealized sections here. The first one I'm going to show you is an idealized section of one of the two types of very of most common gold deposits or precious metal deposits found in Nevada, and those are Bonanza epithermal gold deposits. How many of you heard of Virginia City or the Comstock Lode? Okay, how many have been there to the town? Okay, well that's what that is. That's a Bonanza type gold deposit. And I'm going to kind of walk you through a, an idealized cross-section of how those systems form, or how geologists believe they form. So we're going to start with some with with a fault here the, that created permeability in the volcanic country rock, and then we're going to send up some hot solutions from some of these these magmatic sources that we have in this shallow crust of Nevada. And we're going to see some venting of those at the surface here, of hot springs. Okay, and and you typically get what's called the propolitic envelope or propolitic alteration zone around these. So if you walk through Virginia City, you see this really light colored rock, and and sometimes kind of green colored alteration there. Then we have in one of those systems somewhere down in the earth. The boiling zone, where these hot solutions begin to boil as they as they before they bend towards the surface, and more altered rocks on the surface. Uh, the volcanic rocks get altered to clay, and on the very top of the surface, a hot spring silica cap or a sinter. 
I don't know, how many of you have seen a center? They're very common in Nevada above the top of a hot springs. It's got a real silicious white stuff that is up there, typical of what you find in a, in a hot spring, because the, the hot solutions bring up silica, which has an inverse solubility, and then it cools and forms these silica caps. Now visualize too, so we'll get to this later, if you put a drill hole right down through here to there, you're probably gonna get hot water or steam. And, and that's the very system that you see that geothermal systems exploit now, both in California and Nevada, where they drill into hot steam or water and generate electricity from that. That'd be a, an active geothermal system. So then we have above that boiling zone, the bonanza zone, so very usually very higher, higher grade vein type gold and silver deposits that were mined underground. And beneath that, you find your base metal zone. So they're, they're vertically zoned. Um, there's only been one Bonanza gold deposit that's been found, really, <coughs> in my 30 years over there, and that's the Midas mine. And actually, I got to be, when it was a Newmont operation, and then I was the vice president then, and I'll pass around the rock. This is what those look like. Those are silver selenides, and if you want to pass it through, silver selenides, ruby silvers, and gold. So that's a fairly high-grade piece of a, of a Bonanza gold deposit at Midas, which is in northern Elko County. And those are all the gang minerals at, in the zones where those are they're formed. So that's what the economic geologists would look for. There was a lot of these found, but they were mostly found in mine, you know, in the late 1800s through, you know, the 1930s or thereabout. They're kind of tough to drill out. Let's go to what's more common now. A, a this is an idealized section of a Carlin type deposit. And these are, are sedimentary hosted deposits. These are the paleo, typically the Paleozoic age carbonates and siltstones and so forth that are that were folded and faulted out there uh, through all of these orogenic events. And again, we have basin and age, basin and range age faulting, 17. These are typically 30 to 40 million years old, thereabouts. Faults that came through them, and hot solutions started to recirculate up, and those solutions carried metals with them. So you can see the limestones and shales and so forth there. And as these hot solutions dissolved the carbonates, that's called decarbonization, those zones then collapsed and formed collapse stretches. And geologically, if you're, if you're going through sections out there, you can, you can see these things. They look almost like, um, like conglomerates inside, the, inside the, um, uh, the old Paleozoic rocks. And that's one of the good indicators geologists, geologists use. And then silica comes through and, and uh, forms jasperoids, which are really hard, silicified, replaced limestones. And if you erode the top of this off right here, let's say over millions of years, these jasperoids sort of stick up, stick up as big scabs out there. And that's another thing the economic geologists uh, are, are always looking for, particularly along range fronts. So that's, that's a uh, sediment-hosted or carlin-type deposit model. And, and those are the ones that have, have predominantly been mined as bulk mineable deposits for the past 30 years. Okay, so I've covered that. Now I'm going to go into just a little bit about Nevada, um, Nevada mining production. Nevada last year was the second largest hard rock mining state in the nation behind, behind Arizona. And it forms a big part of our economy. Over there. It's about 1% of the employment. I think about 4% of the, of the gross revenue for the state. And our largest export as a state is actually gold. Uh, Nevada produced almost uh, a little over $6 billion in gold. This is a gross revenue chart showing, showing actual value for all the commodities that are produced. These are the major commodities right here by year. And it includes the current price. So you see this big drop in what looks like, oh, gold production is going down. Actually, no, the price of gold you know, went down for the most part. So these are, like all mines, uh, these, these things are, are basically commodities. So we're 85% 80, of our gross revenue in Nevada out of mining comes from gold. Copper's number two. And then we go to aggregates, geothermal energy, um, and a whole plethora of different industrial minerals. So I'm going to talk a little bit about gold deposits here real quickly. This, is, this picture was taken last summer at at Barrick Gold's Arturo Pit, which is out uh, north of Carlin. And it is a oxide ore pit that they're mining. Notice it's red. And when you compare that with the next slide there, 
I can't tell you whether this is ore waste in the face because they have to drill holes in it and, and determine that by doing assays, uh, blast hole assays, if they mine it. These six people actually were, were uh, our six interns at the Division of Minerals last summer. We hired six uh, undergraduate interns every summer to do abandoned mine land mapping and work and various things that we do in the state. So these were, I think, mostly UNR and, and one UNLV student that worked for the summer. Now notice, this isn't red. This is not oxide ore. This is sulfitic or refractory ore. This is a pit that's nearby the Arturo pit. This is the main post Betsy pit, which has been mined for uh, over 20 years. Pretty pretty large pit. Uh, half on one half of it, side of it, it was Newmont. So I got to mine part of this pit, and Barrick Barrick mines predominantly most of it. What you see right here is is carbonates and siltstones and lower plate rock, antler rock, mainly. Uh, um, Roberts Mountain Formation, which is the host for most of the ore out in uh, in, in uh, the Carlin Trend there. And you see some igneous <coughs> dikes that have come up through here that have exploited faults and so forth that are in there. But pretty nondescript. And down here you see uh, blast holes uh, that have been drilled. That's what these little dots are right here. And it looks, looks like they're probably loading those blast holes and they're gonna, gonna shoot that, that uh, shoot around in the pit and then they'll go in. This is this is what would be called shot muck in the pit right here. This has been blasted. See the hummocky pattern to it. This is a pretty good sized pit here. Um, Barrick employs I think somewhere around 3,500 people at the various mines they have in Nevada. Um, within a mile of that there's underground mining. As in the Carlin trend there's both surface and underground mining. Underground mining is done usually at deeper levels and higher grade ores. Um, about 30% of the gold produced in Nevada right now is coming from underground mines. When I started there 30 years ago, there was no underground mines. And it's migrated there because A, it's, 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 it can be easier to get to uh, as far as, you know, not easier to get to with regards to sinking shafts, but it's easier to permit because it has a smaller footprint, has less environmental impact. When the price of gold changes, you don't have to change your shapes so much when you're mining so economically. The, the big thing about underground mining is it takes higher grades to mine underground. But you see the, you see the same uh, refractory type ore. Um, again, here's the interns and they're standing next to a rock bolter here. And this is a face that's probably an ore face that they're, that they're working on. It will be soon drilling and shooting. Um, south of Battle Mountain, another gold deposit here. This, this is a Newmont one. Um, <coughs> I actually got to put this into production myself back at the end of 2005. It's advanced since then. It's called a Fortitude Deposit. It's an old gold, silver, uh, copper um, district in the Galena range. And this is somewhat different ore because it's polymetallic. It takes all three of it. They, they extract all three of those elements from the ore there. Um, it's Mesozoic. Uh, uh, age rockets in the in the Havala pumpernickel sequence. But again, you can see igneous dikes and so forth in here. You can see faults in the face of the of the pit here where material is, is moved around. And mo around most of those igneous dikes, there are scarn type mineralization, uh, which uh, is a little bit different than, than Carlin type mineralization. Newmont employs, I think, about 3,000 people in Nevada. So an exploration project now we'll go to. Um, this is the Long Canyon uh, deposit, which is a deposit that was found in the Pequot Mountains in Elko County uh, in the ore being the Pequot limestone. You can see the location here. It's not far from the Utah border here. And it is a oxide um, carlin type deposit. And I took that picture myself just sometime in the past year. That's about two feet below the soil surface right there. So that's kind of oxidized carbonates there. And the grade of the ore right there is half an ounce per ton, which is pretty high. Pretty high, right beneath the surface. What What uh, is kind of interesting about that, this is the deposit here, the, this Pequot Mountains. These are the drill roads, and all those little dots are drill pads. So they, they spent two years del doing delineation drilling on this and then went through their full EIS permitting with the BLM, because this is on federal land. And they've actually started uh, constructing the facilities here to have a mine. 
Uh, interestingly enough, historically, this is this is uh, the Big Springs Ranch right here. This was actually the haste, part of the Hastings cutoff that went through here that the Donner Party took, and you know that that deposit was actually found with with uh, a string sediment sampling that geologists did along here when they were able to pick up some some of the, the indicator elements to gold deposits, which are mercury, arsenic, and so forth, and the soils and the washes that come down there. It takes about three years, at least, to go through a full EIS doing background and so forth here, because you have to do your biological uh, your biological studies and, and then do your, your cradle-to-grave plan for the mine, of how you're going to mine it, how you're going to extract it, how you're going to avoid impacts to the environment, and how you're going to close it so that it's not uh, an environmental hazard once it's shut down. Nevada is called the silver state, and silver is mainly a byproduct of gold production in the state of Nevada. They go together as precious metals. So I can't say that there's one particular mine that is, is a silver-only producer. There's one called the Port Rochester Mine in the Humboldt Range, which produces a lot of silver, but the value that they produce in gold still exceeds the amount of silver. Gold production for the state of Nevada um, it's been hovering around that 5 million ounce per year range, peaked in, in about 1990, and, and most of this is really because a lot, of the, a lot of the processing of that is refractory plants. It's fairly complex chemical process industry plants like autoclaves and roasters that do the pretreatment. So there's not a lot of oxide ores remaining out there. So they're fixed capacity plants, and what really drives mining anymore is grade and the price of gold. So let's go on to base metals. What are base metals? Well, base metals are everything. They're not precious metals, so not gold, not silver, not platinum. And all those things that really are used in industry, copper, zinc, lead, that, that, uh, we, we, uh, that we use in our, in our daily life here. And Nevada has had a long history of mining what are called porphyry copper deposits over there. The Yarrington District and the Ely District being the preeminent two, two areas. Porphyry copper deposits are very different than gold deposits, and I have kind of an idealized cross-section here that I borrowed from a book on these that just shows really what, what is the top of, of essentially a magma chamber that has a lot of metals in it that cools with time, and those metals uh, uh, precipitate mainly as sulfides. In the case of copper, it's usually chalcopyrite. Um, and, and, um, in the case of molybdenum, it's uh, molybdenite, because those are the two that you see very commonly as, as porphyry deposits. So I'm going to move into a couple examples of those that are actually being mined. The first is, is the Robinson Mine in Ely. And that actually has been mined since 1906. So produced copper mainly, took us through two world wars, has had on and off mining, depending on the price of copper and has been operating probably for the last 10 or 15 years now, but it has a very long history. It's produced over 5 billion pounds of copper over its life and 3.5 million ounces of coal. It still has a fairly fairly good uh, lifespan to it, but let's, let's keep in mind that previous slide of the porphyry copper deposit. And what I like about this slide is, here's basically the cupola right here of what you're looking at in that pit. See the white? That's the, that's the the, the, the igneous uh, rock that formed and that those copper sulfides went into the country rock here and are also found there. So uh, you see a, a bench here that's being drilled with blast hole drills and then a shovel down here that's mucking shot mine. Another district on the other side of the state is the Yarrington district. It's been there for many, many years operating as, a, as mines, but, but it shut down in the late 80s as I recall. Uh, when copper prices got down low. Um, several years ago, a company called Nevada Copper um, went back and, and looked up a deposit that had been known for years. Uh, copper prices then were a little over about 350 a pound thereabouts. So, so again, economics was driving that. And, and they tied up a property um, in the district there that it originally been discovered by U.S. Steel in 1959 using blind airborne magnetics. And the reason they were able to do that is it's a flat line, fairly high grade copper deposit that has about 10% magnetite to it. So it was a huge magnetic anomaly. 
Uh, they have been sinking a shaft on that as they execute their plan because they're going to mine it underground. This is the shaft. I took a picture of that just just last November, and they were about at 1,900 feet, which is the top of the deposit, and the shaft will go to 2,100 feet, which is the bottom of the deposit. So they will. So they have been drifting out from from the shaft station about 600 feet on each side and putting in their drill platforms to delineate their their uh, deposits so that they can actually begin to mine it and uh, finish off. And then they'll they'll drop that ore down to the 2100 foot level and it will skip up through, through the shaft there. This is uh, uh, a polished section of the ore here. You see the calcium pyrite in there. It's about 2% copper, so it's a pretty high grade copper deposit. The Mount Hope deposit is, is located near uh, Eureka. You see on your map, there's sort of the central part of the state. And it actually was discovered by Exxon Minerals back in the late 70s. Molybdenum is a, is a base metal, ferroalloy used, used to mix with, with, to make steels. If you, if you drive a car, you have some molybdenum in it because it's used in the gearing in your engines and so forth like that. And, and the U.S. is actually one of the few things we are an exporter of, two things, gold and molybdenum uh, to, to other countries. We import most of the rest of the stuff. But this deposit uh, sits uh, out north of Eureka. And what you see here is a cross section through the deposit. It's a porphyry molybdenum deposit. And this is the outline of what is planned for the ultimate pit uh, that they have planned there. Uh, they have this fully permitted. This is this is Mount Hope that you see right here off the highway, and the drill roads that you see right here will be ultimately the pits. Forty forty year mine life will create about forty four hundred jobs during that period of time, and generate a lot of tax revenue for the state. Copper production in Nevada is from two producers. That one that I showed you in Ely and Newmont's. Uh, uh, fortitude pit there. So uh, the production last year was about 132 million pounds. We're not a major copper producer, but that's what's growing. Here was our 2014 metal production. Uh, the Division of Minerals is required to collect that from all, all the uh, different operators. It's one of our duties to report it to the legislature and the governor and anybody in the public that wants it, that, that wants to know how much, how much was mined uh, for metals, energy mineral, and fluid minerals in the state. So let's go to industrial minerals. Um, you know, we're kind of in a metals price down cycle right now. Gold hit $1,900 an ounce, I think three years ago, and it's now $1,200. The dollar's climbing. Typically, metals, particularly precious metals, have an inverse kind of relationship with the strength of the dollar. And, and so those things are down a little bit. A little less exploration going on over there than there was in the past. But what has really increased is industrials, because most industrials are used for manufacturing and construction. These are all the things that, that we produce in Nevada uh, at various mines, and these are all marked on, on those maps that you have right there. And I'm going to start first with, with one of my favorites here, one was, that was very interesting to our legislature this last year, and that's lithium. Nevada has the only North American lith producing lithium mine, and it's one of the few free world uh, uh, producers of lithium, because lithium is produced in China, Argentina, and Chile. Other, otherwise, and of course, it's becoming an industrial material that is ever more in demand with the manufacturing of lithium batteries. And as we call it around in Reno, there the Tesla effect. If you were following that at all, Tesla's building the world's largest lithium battery plant just east of Reno, in an industrial park there, uh, which which is having a big economic impact on on, on the, the area right now in a positive way. So this one actually started in 1966, and it's a and it's a brine operation. Not everything's mined with open pit. This is in a place called Clayton Valley. It would be on your map there. And the Clayton Valley is about in the central eastern part of the or western part of the state. And it's a valley where where you know there's there's no flow of water in or out of it. And if you drill a well, you're going to get salty water. And what they did it is back in the 60s they. They drilled holes here, and they found that a number of these briny aquifers had high levels of <coughs> lithium with that salt brine. So they, they tested each one of those, those aquifers. Those wells go down to probably 500 feet deep. 
and, and came up with a process whereby they actually pumped this lithium bearing brine to the surface and they put it through what I call a racetrack of evaporation ponds. And it comes up at maybe 20 or 30 parts per million lithium. They evaporate the, the concentrated work for them there. Their byproduct, by the way, as you can see it here, is sodium chloride, or regular salt, which, which they uh, typically sell to the highway department and, and other users. It's a high lithium salt, so you wouldn't find it in the market. Here's a little bit about their process itself of how it's of how it's done. The evaporation, the brining, they pull that into this plant right here. Um, here's Lucia Patterson here, and, and we're walking into the, the Rockwood lithium plant here, and there's a bunch of tanks in there, and they run some inorganic chemicals into those, precipitate out the impurities, and then they add, uh, um, I think it's uh, sodium, um, soda ash to it and it precipitates out the, the lithium as lithium carbonate, which is what this is. This is out of that plant, if you want to pass that around, just a white powder material. But that's, that's the fundamental building block of everything that's, that's produced for lithium. That's the way the mines down in South America produce it also. And from there, it's refined into other things like lithium. You see a drum of it right here. Lithium hydroxide monohydrate that's actually sitting down there in the in the warehouse of the plant. And I know you can't see it right here, but it says battery grade. So that's what lithium batteries are made out of. There are other lithium exploration programs going on in the state. It's actually one of the big rushes right now. There was a big announcement yesterday by a company called Pure Energy Minerals that they had signed a deal with Tesla to, to produce and supply them with lithium. There's one up in the northern part of the state that is uh, exploiting a lithium clay called hectorite that is a moat <coughs> deposit up here on the Nevada-Oregon border, up here, again, on federal land. This is, this is some of the hectorite clay. They actually mine that, and they produce a, a, a drilling mud in the city of Fernley that's used in high temperature drilling, so drilling for hydraulic fracturing and, and geothermal drilling and so forth. Ferrite production. What's ferrite used for? Good. There's pharma pharmaceutical uses, right? The real pure stuff. What else? What's unique about ferrite? It's heavy, right? About twice what silica is. Ferrite is is used mainly in drilling muds for the drilling of oil and geothermal wells because it has a high specific gravity. Because when you drill an oil well or gas well, you're worried about getting a high pressure gas pocket and it coming up. So what's the best defense of that? Use drilling mud that has twice the weight of the rock that you just removed from it. And that's why Barra is used in drilling mud. Nevada's been a traditional producer. You know, most of these are owned by Halliburton and National Oil Well Barco and so forth that do the mining out there. It's been really steady for many, many years. Peaked early on here and it's been on a steady rise. Uh, most of this is in Lander and some in Elko County. So we had seven mines and four operators that reported last year. Here's an interesting story, Chipsum, right? Um, Chipsum has got a number of different applications, but the biggest use is the making of this stuff right here. No, that's plaster. But plaster, there's gypsum and plaster too. I was thinking it was drywall. Then forgetting how old this building is. <laughs> Not too hard. Yeah. But drywall in your house, gypsum drywall. Um, and also in agricultural supplements. If you're going through the valley here, sometimes you look off and you see these little white dots in there that look like giant gopher holes that have come up. Usually that's gypsum that's come out of Nevada and they spread it in the fields because it is a soil treatment there. It breaks down the clays and, uh, and provides uh, some, some uh, lowering of the pH. Gypsum production in Nevada has just about doubled in the last three years. And that's a good indication that we got a lot more construction going on. Because uh, the major part of that is building homes and, and buildings. So I'll give one example of this one here. This is actually down in Clark County because most of our gypsum production is down here. There's one mine up near Carson City, but the two big drywall plants are down there. This is Pabco Pacific Coast Building Products. They also run timber yards and various things like that. And, and this is a big deposit east of Las Vegas in a Miocene age 
um, uh, formation. It's a it's almost horizontally um, dipping here. It's a horizontal deposit that's exposed for about five miles, and it's in the Horse Springs Formation. It's 120 feet thick. These deposits have got some clays and so forth in them. So when they mine them, what you see here is this is actually the mine. You see the benches in there. Not near as steep or, or big as what you see in a gold mine because you know they're limited by their plant capacity. So they go out here, they mine, they tram it in with a loader, put it in a crusher right there, and it's coming up on a conveyor belt to a plant. And here's the conveyor belt looking the other way, the plants off here, over here. And this these buildings here actually, you run into this in, in a lot of different applications, are actually uh, gas-fired peaker plants for power. And they use the exhaust gas, the waste exhaust gas is, is routed into the gypsum plant for drying of the wallboard. So sometimes you see two, in, two, two industries that have come together in some synergistic fashion to do something. There. I like that about this. Um, here's the wallboard, and, and if you go to Home Depot, I think these guys have the contract to supply Home Depot, you'll probably see Pabco gypsum drywall pieces. There, they're sold. Limestone production. Um, we have seven, over nine, ten mines reporting what it looks like right, last year. Um, nine, nine mines. Limestone, you know, is, is pretty common, but nice clean limestone isn't so common. And this is a piece of limestone from the Crystal Pass Formation down in, in Clark County, which is a fairly clean limestone. And limestone is mined for several different purposes. This is the building blocks of making cement and cement's needed to make concrete, right? And also for the production of what's called chemical lime. Chemical lime is, is, uh, is taking limestone and driving off the, uh, um, driving off, you heat it up, you drive off the CO2 and you make CAO, which, which is, is lime, and then, and then that is typically in various different types of industrial applications, everything from scrubbing SO2 in coal-fired power plants to um, building and constructing roads, because asphalt has to be pickled with lime. So this is a big plant that's down there in Clark County. Again, uh, like most industrial minerals, they're oftentimes close to a big metropolitan area where a lot of the material is used. The Crystal Pass is a Devonian uh, limestone, Devonian age limestone, so, so again, back to those Paleozoic age rocks. And they also mine uh, a dolomite down there, uh, which is from the Monte Cristo uh, formation as they produce a dolomitic line also. Here's the actual pits, the two different pits. They're right next to each other here and they mine that with, with surface pits and 85 ton haul trucks and, uh, and wheel loaders. And here's the plant. These are big plants typically. This is looking from the, from the, the bin, the final product bin down onto the plant. These are calcining kilns so the limestone's been crushed. It's going in here. It's being heated and the CO2 has been driven off. This is the dolomite kiln right here. It's a, it's a big plant. There's a lot of railroad rail that comes out and supplies a lot of the lime for making cement in northern Arizona and southern California. Nevada aggregates. Um, what are aggregates? Well, there's they can be any kind of rock uh, that's crushed and is used to, to make concrete, right? Because concrete is cement plus aggregates. Um, and for asphalt, for roads, anything you use crushed rock for there in aggregate production. Again, it's gone up and it's a big indication that we're, we're doing more construction. Other industrial minerals produced in, in Nevada. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the, the lithium compounds. We have a mine in the central part of the state in Gabs, Nevada that, that uh, mines magnesium carbonate and has been doing that since 1941. And that's pr that is uh, produced and used in the production of lightweight concrete and animal feeds. Diatomaceous earth, which is, I'm going to show you on the next slide, uh, which is used to do everything from clean up oil spills to filter beer, and salt and zeolites. Zeolites are, are uh, naturally occurring uh, ion exchange minerals that that are typically used to remove like things from, from water, ammonia from water. If you have a, a uh, an aquarium at home or have ever had one and you buy the material that it filters through, it's probably a zeolite. The other, there's other types of zeolites that are used for nuclear cleanup. We actually produce a lot of zeolites in Nevada 
that were shipped to the Fukushima Daiichi cleanup because there's a certain type, and that's it right there, a cabazite, that, that will absorb cesium-137. There's, there's the diatomaceous earth pit east of Reno at, at the Eagle Pitcher Mine. Diatomaceous earth is, is uh, these, these are uh, cenozoic age deposits and, and they look really white and what they are is they're dead diatoms from inland shallow seas that died. They had little silica tests. They're all very, very well sorted. So they make good, good filtration uh, material and they are used commonly to pre-coat filters. So, if you drink beer, all, almost all beer, unless it's you know the, the cloudy wheat beer, has been has been filtered through plate and frame filters that are pre-coated with diatomaceous earth. They ship this stuff all over the world. Why is Nevada uh, an active mining state? Well, you know I think there's some pretty pretty common things here because because you, you wonder well gee how how do we end up with so many mines in Nevada? Well you know the geology is there and you can see it because it's, it's the most arid state in the Union. It averages seven inches of rain a year. So there's not a lot of trees except in the, in the high mountains. So the geology is exposed. It's 85% federal land. That's the highest of any state. So, so it allows for um, use of the 1872 mining law for leasing and staking of, of claims in, in the state of Nevada by companies that want to do business there. Pretty low population density. You know, you don't find big, big open pit mines next to big cities. That's a bad place for them. But out in rural Nevada, where there's 15 counties and 100,000 people, it's the way everybody makes their living. So, so it's it's uh, mining friendly with regards to the state and the local governments that are out there, and the state has a, a pretty favorable regulatory and tax structure to to promote that. These are the active mining claims. Uh, by year for the state of Nevada. They tend to move with the price of gold, as you can imagine. So I love this, this particular <laughs> slide here because these, these are the largest ex exports by states in the U.S. and I ran across it here several months ago when I was looking at stuff. You can see California, the, your biggest export is airplanes. Nevada, our biggest export is gold. Wyoming is soda ash. Um, you know, but it's, it's an interesting one there. The, the really interesting ones you run over here is diamonds. Why is New York, you know, the biggest diamond exporter? They don't mine diamonds there, but they but they cut a lot of diamonds there and export them. So interesting graph. Well, I'll move on to uh, geothermal energy, fluid minerals. Uh, we are the second largest geothermal energy producer in the in the nation, right behind California, California right, which is where a lot of it started. Uh, and this is a graph of of net production in millions of megawatt hours from the plants in Nevada by year and the average price that they receive. The geothermal producers love to see this graph. And you can see that it's just been a 30 year history. Next year, in fact, we're having the Geothermal Resources Conference Convention in Reno. And we're celebrating 30 years of geothermal energy for the state of Nevada. We've minted a medallion and so forth for that. Uh, some of the early stuff, which was mainly drilling hot springs, uh, kind of plateaued off here, and then there was some federal incentives to, to go back and do geothermal, and some technological changes too that, that, that occurred in the development of what are called binary plants. So you no longer needed steam to generate, to, to go through turbines. You could actually bring up hot water that wasn't boiling, put it through heat exchangers and binary systems, and heat a refrigerant that did become vapor and drive a turbine, and when the binary technology started to take over, all of a sudden, uh, these plants started re-equipping themselves with, with uh, what are called bottoming cycles, binary cycles, and production started going up. So that's enough for about 247,000 homes in the state of, of Nevada. A lot of that power is actually shipped to California. There's certain states, including California, that have a requirement to reach a certain number of renewables by, by certain dates and years. And geothermal is really the only the only arguably base load renewable. The, the sun doesn't have to be shining and the wind doesn't have to be blowing. They're, they're running on, on, on steam regularly. They're not big plants. Uh, we have 24 of those power plants in the state of Nevada in, in 16 different geothermal fields. Uh, this is drilling of geothermal, uh, drilling geothermal holes in the McGinnis Hills uh, deposit. And it used to be, you know, geologists would look for 
for hot springs, actually this deposit, McGinnis Hills, was a blind deposit found by geologists intersecting structural trends and doing geophysics and coming up with anomalies. They put holes in it, and lo and behold, 3,000 feet deep, they started running into steam. Is that the Big Grass Valley? Yes, it is. Yeah. That's now a 70. They put the second unit in last year. That's 70 megawatts of power, which is pretty big for a geothermal plant. This is the Biowawi geothermal plant. It was the first or second, I should say. It sits out off south of I-80 in Crescent Valley, and it's been operating for 30 years. It actually was a steam plant and now has a binary cycle off to the side of it here. It produces 16 megawatts of power. Nevada's not a big oil producer because through all those years, you know, yeah, there was probably a lot of oil in all those, all those carbonates out there. But with that shallow crust that we have out there, I think a lot of it got cooked away geologically in time. But there are a few occurrences out in the eastern part of the state. And uh, you can see our oil production in Nevada peaked about 1990. Um, but the, in Elko, there actually is a Cenozoic age deposit called the Elko Formation, which is a lacustrine shale. It's about 1,700 feet thick in its type section. It's believed to be contemporaneous with the Green River Shale. And, and there's different names for it in the eastern side of the state here. And there was actually a oil from shale operation just right out of Elko there. And, and a company by the name of Noble Energy came in and, and made a, a geologic play and did 3D seismic, which is the way these guys look at these basins now. This is a cross section of what they believe is going on. So visualize, say, uh, one of the mountain ranges here and the next mountain range over here. So here's one of the grottoes or valleys. And you could, there are, there are uh, erosional remnants of the Elko on sitting unconformably on Paleozoic rock uh, in some of those areas that they started looking at. And indeed, they're hydrocarbon bearing, but they never reached thermal maturity. They were never buried deep enough for the oil to become mature. So they, they postulated that as the basin and range uh, formed, that the Elko formation just got faulted down and sits on top of the Paleozoic rocks at the bottom of these basins, which are 5,000 to 10,000 feet thick. And with that kind of weight and pressure, the oil would become mature. So they tied up a bunch of ground, as oil companies do, brought in you know, these big oil drilling rigs here, and started punching holes. Here's their, their land position here. Elko's over here. Uh, these are these little dots here would be a square mile, so it's a pretty significant position. But notice it's right in the middle of the valleys; it's not in the mountains. And um, they drilled uh, two wells that they actually produced from. This is a, a well down by Jigs. This was the K1L well in Huntington Valley. This is a this is a tank battery, as it's called in the oil. This was a 10,000 foot well, and it actually produced some oil that they shipped. It's a very high paraffin oil. Go ahead and open that up and smell it if you'd like to, you know. Uh, it, it won't pour, it won't pour out because it's really high paraffin oil. But uh, it's very, very common type of oil for, for something called the Green River Shale deposit. So I'll move on here um, to a couple other things. Geologic mapping that goes on in the state every year, the, the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology does a few more quadrangles. They employ quite a number of geologists in the state out of Reno. Uh, they typically try to do some urban area mapping here for faults and hazards, Las Vegas, Reno. And they also do some in the eastern part of the state. But what you see here in the dark are the quadrants, the quadrangles that we have mapped. And as you can see, a lot of Nevada is unmapped, <laughs> which makes it an interesting place. I'm just going to flip through these pretty quick because I know I'm going to run out of time. But just know, we. These mining companies and the companies that operate there are required to do reclamation. This is actually a reclaimed and closed mine near Winnemucca. These were leach pads. Uh, this got an award at the Nevada Mining Association uh, this year that we, that we handed out. And it's fully closed and back to, to public use. Some other ones, this one's in Virginia City here. This was Comstock Mining and you can see a reclaimed slope here that they completed this last year a pit uh, in the Humboldt Range that a company uh, backfilled as they were mining other pits and they contoured it here and had it planted. Some thoughts for you that want to pursue careers uh, in mining. 
uh, the different types of, of, uh, of degrees that companies out there hire. And uh, those things that I think would be useful to you, you know. Um, there wasn't GIS when I went to school here, but you can't survive without it anymore. Um, our, our view is, is almost a must to get, to get a position anywhere. Hydrogeology, I did take here, and I found that to be extremely helpful in understanding permeability, porosity, from everything from how long does it take breakthrough on a leach pad gold leach pad to just understanding geology, surveying, environmental classes. There's just a lot of geologists that are in the environmental departments. Every mine has an environmental department that does the permitting and the sampling, air and water sampling that they are required to do under their permits. And computer modeling. That's our website. Um, and thank you.